Aaron Lachant is the CEO of MMLG. They're a cannabis consulting firm. He is going to be moderating this panel. And yeah, they are, um, Aaron's been amazing. He's been a really great supporter of Green Market Report, and we certainly appreciate that. So I'm going to let Aaron take it from here. Thanks, everybody. Um, I have a, a fantastic panel to chat with today, and, and I can't wait to get started. She's a Grammy Award-winning musician, a, a human rights activist, and, and the CEO and founder of Etheridge Farms. Please welcome Melissa Etheridge. Hello. Ah, this close to breaking out into song, but I won't. <laughs> I, I'm just. Oh, it's an audience, a theater. Okay. She. Oh. She is the director of compliance of MMLG, uh, an amateur boxing champion, a playwright, a band leader, a musician, and, and probably one of the most interesting folks you'll meet in cannabis. Ever. Yes. Please welcome Julie Crockett. Hey. He's a 30-year cannabis veteran the chief operating officer of uh, Tyson Ranch and taking on some of the most ambitious projects within the space. Please welcome Kevin Bell. Yeah. And he was the former vice president of brand partnerships at Prohibited. And, and he's now a founder of the content company Ronin. They're building and producing cannabis content all around the world. Please welcome Jason Rood. So our, our panel today is, talk, is about building brands. I just need to pull up some notes. But I, I, first, I first heard about Melissa's brand three years ago, about three years ago. And, and everyone thinks that building a cannabis brand is super easy. It's a license to print money. I, I guess my first question for, for Melissa is, you know, what challenges have you faced in getting your brand up and running in the last three years? Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. Um, Wow. You know, I, I was very excited to talk about celebrity brands and just brands in general. I've spent years talking about cannabis and just pushing the, you know, cannabis is medicine uh, story. And it's really nice to actually be getting kind of into this other side of, oh, yeah, we're selling. We're, you know, it's brands now. How do we how do, how do we make this, you know, work as an industry? And um I knew 15 years ago when I went through breast cancer that uh, cannabis was good medicine. I could see that this is something that should be offered as an alternative to everyone. As as it's just it should be again offered, you know, and not prohibited. And I realized that the work I had done as an artist just building my own, you know, you, from the 90s, you know, the, the, the songs, the, you know, that, that sort of brand, that there's a brand that was Melissa Etheridge. And when I went through breast cancer and then went cannabis, oh, wow, I, I could actually see something in the future. Like, wow, this is something that I could really get behind and do and talk about and show people that, that, that have a whole nother idea about cannabis. And it was really set me on fire 15 years ago. Just, you know, I wanted, of course, 15 years ago, I, you, you had to, I had to go to my roadie who knew another roadie to go get the, you know, the briefcase of the, you know, so this is a long time ago. And, and you know, so I've seen it come along until about 10 years ago, I started talking about, yeah, you know, I'm Melissa Etheridge and I'm making cannabis and, and I started meeting cannabis folks. And, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a colorful industry and lots of different types of folks. And um, I just met a lot and I learned a lot. And I, I love that people think I'm making money hand over fist, but that's not <laughs> how it is. I am actually putting a lot of my own finances in and I've, I've built this brand finding the finest medicine makers, understanding how it works, meeting with state officials, meeting with federal officials about the future, meeting, uh, finding out what, what does it take to move this whole thing forward so I can um, have a brand that, that I, can, I can work on how am I going to sell to people instead of how do I stay out of jail? You know, that, that sort of, you, getting us into this, into the light of it. So Etheridge Farms, I still haven't sold 
a single product, yet I have built, I have a, an entire uh, you know, system that is coming on this year and, and, and starting, and, and it's, been, it's been such an amazing journey. So it's not easy. If, I don't know if there's any famous people here looking to, <laughs> to think if you're you know, looking for a brand, but to brand, when we get to that place where we're branding cannabis, I think the first thing you really need to know is you need to know a lot about cannabis. You need to have a, a direction. It, it, there needs to be a, a knowledge of the, the history and the, the spirit in which we're coming from and what, are we, what we're changing. So it's, 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 yes, it's message and all that. What we, uh, what, what we do is, as capitalists, and then there's this whole big part of it that uh, that's 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 really what the Etheridge brand is all about. And I'll answer lots of questions about that. Go ahead. There you go. <laughs> I'm not selling wine. I I want to I want to no, I just want to clear. If you're reading the uh, bios, it says that there's a lot about this wine that I talked about about ten years ago because at that time I thought that was a great idea and I had had some and it was a great product. The, the laws don't allow uh, alcohol and cannabis to be mixed yet, so that doesn't exist. That whole, the, uh, it's an old story that somebody found. So I'm not making wine, I'm making actual, uh, you know, tinctures and, you know, health-focused cannabis. Now, go ahead. Thank but, you. Well, that, that's interesting that you're producing more of a health-focused cannabis product. Most, most companies out there seem to be marketing towards the 20-something crowd, particular, particularly young men. Who, who is Etheridge Farms targeted at? Who's your target audience for your product? Moms. Moms are who? Moms. Moms. Moms who are tired of... Uh, drinking a couple glasses of wine to wind down or taking that Ambien, moms that want to feel better in the morning when they wake up, moms that are looking for uh, a, a, an, an alternative to sort of the, the pharmaceutical, the only solutions that we have. So, yes, moms. And I think another question I had was, you know, as cannabis becomes a little bit more crowded with, with each passing days, are, are there any lessons you can draw upon from the music industry that, that, have, that have kept you, kept you on, on the right path moving forward on this? I tell you what, one of the biggest lessons I learned from the music industry that I totally keep in mind here is it really isn't a competition, that there's room for everyone. Absolutely, and, and I remember when my first album came out, I was like, here I am, and the day my album came out was also the day that Tracy Chapman's album came out, the day that Tony Childs, Sinead O'Connor, it was a massive amount of women, and, I, and for a while there I was like, oh, there's not gonna be enough room for me, and, and I put myself in competition with these other, and that's not true. The more there is, the more there is, the better it is, so let's work together as an industry instead of, in such competition with each other. That's a, that's a, that's a great message. Isn't that right, Tyson? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right on. And, and, and so, uh, Kevin, also working with, with a celebrity-focused brand, you know, in, in what way has Mike been able to leverage his celebrity in order to, to build this Tyson Ranch brand and, and have this platform? Well, with Mike, we got lucky, because uh, um, in a way, Mike's a next-level celebrity. I mean. Everybody wants to meet Drake, but Drake wants to meet Mike. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, Mike isn't like a, a celebrity endorsement on a brand. Mike is the brand. He lives this. Every day he comes to work, uh, uh, he's there five days a week. He smokes cannabis. He believes in this lifestyle. He believes that it's medicine. It's made him a better father, a better businessman. And so with Mike, so many people really care about what he's doing, you know, and feel connected to him that, you know, all we really got to do is tell the story that's happening, tell the truth. And that, that comes off genuine with Mike. And that's, that's how we got lucky. It's not like we have to figure out how to market Mike. All we have to do is, you know, film what's happening, tell the story. 
So it's, it's my understanding, Tyson Ranch, it, it's a cannabis company, it, it's also an entertainment company. What, um, what projects have you guys been involved with in the entertainment industry that have helped to build the Tyson Ranch brand? Well, um, for first, we have the podcast. So, you know, I don't know if everybody's listened to it. It's called Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson. Um, it's on YouTube. <laughs> it's in, uh, uh, it's, you know, I believe we got 700,000 subscribers now. Um, it's got a strong following. Um, so that's one that allows us to bring other celebrities past us and use their brand or their brand equity to d drag through Mike, have that interaction and um, gather new customers through their celebrities as well. It also um, allows Mike to have people relate to him because Mike really isn't who people think they are. And when you listen to him on the podcast, you get to know him and that's important. We also uh, did a festival, which is another way that we found of branding. You know, we had uh, the Kind Festival out on our, our ranch or the land in the desert that will soon be the ranch. And we did a great success with that. We're going to do that again in February. Very cool. Um, uh, but, but like you said, um, we are a brand. We actually don't hold any cannabis licenses. We actually um, are just a brand. We're not looking to buy expensive real estate that... Uh, or, or spend time getting compliant. We really just make relationships with the, the farmers that uh, grow the best products. Great, and, and, and this is a question that's open for everybody, but, but there seems to be, you know, you need to strike a balance between putting your resources towards branding, but at the same time also putting your resources towards having just an amazing product to put on the shelves. You know, I'll, I'll start with Kevin, but how do you strike that balance in building your brand and, and maintaining quality control? And Jason, Melissa, anyone who wants to jump in, like, go for it. Um, well, quality control is most important because one wrong thing, a thousand right things won't equal one wrong. So, you know, with us, quality control is most important. Anytime we do any kind of research, any kind of testing, or like when cannabis is actually bottled up. There's somebody on our payroll that has our agenda in the building watching it happen. Um, and that, there is, you just have to have quality control. Because like I said, if we, we kind of get a free, everybody says yes the first time, but the first time we put something bad in a bottle, that, that could be the end of the brand. And you, we've seen other brands, you know, I'm not going to name them, but that came out strong with great brand equity, and then they grew too quick, and they couldn't keep quality control. They started putting bad stuff in a bottle, and really that brand lost its equity. So first, we don't overgrow. We don't want to grow too quick. We want to be able to keep up with our quality. We make sure somebody's there. But also being a brand, it lets us move light on our feet, meaning that, you know, if I was a grower and I was to produce a bad crop, I would have to deal with that. It's on my bottom line. Um, what am I going to do? Am I going to discount it? As a brand, um, if they produce a bad crop, I go next. Um, and that is, is what's great about being a brand. And then the other side to that is that, you know, um, when, uh, uh, when, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> it's all good. We understand. Uh, <laughs> I, I think earlier it was mentioned, and I thought it was profound, that what a brand is is a promise. It's a promise of quality. It's a promise of a conveyance of an ideology. Um, you know, whether it's, it's sort of a psychographic community, a small group of people uh, that collectively identify, uh, or you even scale to a broader uh, group of folks, quality, um, is critical or a cornerstone to a brand. And, and I agree in, in many ways not having to carry uh, the liability that's associated with producing product can be uh, an advantage. I certainly think that investors and, and folks in the community are looking at it um, you know, with a moat in between that brands sit here and, and production sits here. I, I think it's positive. You know, Starbucks uh, doesn't own a whole lot of Arabica beans. Uh, uh, Josh, I think uh, one of our co-founders talks about Casamigas on a regular basis because they sold for a billion dollars and, and they never owned an agave plant. That being said, uh, quality control, and I, I think Melissa can speak to this because of the, some of the medicine makers that she chose to partner with, uh, coming from ideologies with, with standard operating procedures that are profound, uh, certainly help uh, for you to convey that brand more collectively and uphold your promise.
Yeah, we decided as a brand actually to own a manufacturing license, to have the manufacturing license so that we do have complete control. Yeah, we do, uh, we have a whole bunch of growers that are separate growers, but we know, and we know the organics, we know, you know where, where they're coming from, but we do have our license to manufacture, and it's, uh, bas it's actually was the first, and still is the only manufacturing license in Santa Cruz County. <laughs> I, I agree in the California market, the, uh, the uh, manufacturing license is important because that's what it takes to put it in a jar. And uh, uh, Tyson did uh, fund a social equity program, and that is one of the, th the most important license, I think, in California is the manufacturing license. And the thought I was having that I lost was, you know, ultimately quality control will be controlled by market share and self space. The ability to turn cannabis into money will be much like, you know, any industry that will be the ultimate quality control. The people that have the shelf space and can demand the best product and the best product will find the way to the people who have the market share and shelf space. That's great. I, I, I wanna ask a question to Jason. A lot of folks know you, you used to be at a lot of conferences based on your work at Prohibited. Can you tell us what you're doing at Ronin or what, what does Ronin do that's different than Prohibited? I think that through the evolu evolution of the last, uh, you know, five years, Josh, Drake, uh, and Keith have all done an incredible job, not only building brands, but, but guiding folks, you know, from the black market to the supermarket. Uh, what are we doing now? We have built many successful brands, and in doing so, uh, sort of, you know, decided to make some strategic alliances. Prohibited, um, it's now part of a consumer packaged goods portfolio. Uh, it had a really strong connection uh, to uh, the consumer audience uh, that was built up uh, in its online persona, et cetera. So that was its best function. Future State Brands uh, was born out of Prohibited's brand building prowess uh, and is now a portfolio of 11 brands uh, thus far uh, that, that you are probably already seeing on store shelves. Uh, Josh Shelley uh, and also with a partnership with Burner uh, and ultimately Social Club uh, Television have taken our content library, our brand building, uh, and business knowledge and collectively put that uh, together into a services platform uh, that includes uh, some performance aspects um, and just extending the network that we've already have. Um, again, we've got 55 hours of content in market right now that'll be rebranded um, under the social club uh, categories, and we're now also able to distribute other folks' content. So under the auspices of Prohibited, we were super focused on our own brand integrations, really focused on the brands that we've taken in, uh, and now we're able to do a whole lot more whilst supporting Future State uh, and still cheering on um, the next iteration of what Prohibited will be in the future. Cool. Uh, Julie, can you, can you, uh, hi Julie. Hi. The most interesting woman about, in the world. The, can you talk about the intersection between branding and compliance? Like what folks are, what, tr what trouble are folks running into from a compliance standpoint when they're like building these brands? Uh, well, it's interesting because I think there's so many things going on right now that we're in this moment of transition. Like if you're in it, you know about, uh, you know, this California track and trace and, you know, everybody's coming on to metrics. So we're still in this moment of transition into, you know, there are the regulations and then there's the true enforcement and monitoring of those regulations. And we haven't really seen the full impact of that. But I can tell you as a person that gets to go and look under the hood of a lot of different companies, everybody's doing it wrong. <laughs> across the board, you know, <laughs> just like, uh, to, to the letter of the law, to the regulations, you know, when, when you look under there, mostly because in some ways it's, it's not feasible to do it as written, and, and it, there's a lot of, like, built-in prohibitions, especially if you're trying to develop a brand and we're transitioning from a way we used to do business to, um, you know, this new regime of 
perchance overregulation, let's say. Um, <laughs> however, you know, there, and there's just interesting quirks, you know, like one of the things in Prop 64 was you can't give away free product, and you know, they didn't want people just going and giving away free cannabis to anybody on the street because of the children, oh my gosh, you know. So that makes sense on one level. However, they didn't consider the back-end sales process. So right now, as it stands in the regulations, if you are a manufacturer, there is no compliant way that you can test your own product. There is no compliant way as a distributor that you can give trade samples to your own staff. There is no way that you can take a sample and give it to a buyer and say, would you like to consider this product without it going through the actual retail supply chain and paying the excise tax and doing all those things. So I can guarantee just in that one thing alone of like, how do you handle samples? 99.9% .9 of companies that I you know, audit or review or look at are doing things that aren't exactly you know, completely aligned with compliance. Um, and that doesn't even begin, that's like operational compliance. When you get into what people are doing in the advertising sphere, uh, there's a lot wrong there <laughs> in terms of, of you know, uh, Aaron and I joke a lot. It's, it's one of those things of, I would say the human race, maybe not the best of learning from experience. And when you look back at the early, you know, tobacco advertising of the 20s and 30s, and then look at advertisements now, where in the 20s and 30s, they'd be like, more doctors smoke Marlboro than any other cigarette. And then you see some of the approach to cannabis market right now, it looks oddly familiar. Um, and so these are things that I think are going to catch up with us because right now the enforcement agencies are building out, they're training their people, um, there's not a lot of will uh, of enforcement while you're doing that, but two years from now, when you're bored on a Tuesday at the BCC and it's like, I'm just gonna take a scroll through Instagram and see what this person was doing five years ago, um, you, you know, th because that's the statute on these things, they can levy penalties and fines up to five years later. Uh, for the actions you're taking on 420 this year. Um, uh, th th that's when I think some of these things will come into play. And it's... And Can it's trust. What's that? Can trust. <laughs> trust. Uh, and, and the other aspect of it is that... Uh, you know, as this as this thing rolls out, you know, we haven't really seen what ultimately the appetite for enforcement will be. You know, and but but their authority to enforce is intense. So when you look at the regulations, for example, if if a, if an operator is missing a single uh, record keeping element, the agencies can levy a thirty thousand dollar fine per instance of any administrative failure to keep a record. So, so what that means to me is if the agencies felt like it, they could shut down any business, any day of the week, just on a record keeping audit. So while compliance may seem like the unsexy part of uh, you know, getting out there and building your brand, um, I think that aspect of the ability to survive, the ability to be positively vetted as a valuable company if you're looking to get out or sell your brand or engage with others or when brands are looking to engage with you, that it's really starting more and more that part of that process is people having compliance come in and look at are you going to be able to stand up when we get through this transitional period? And that's why Ronin uses MMLG for all our <laughs> compliance needs. That's why Julie Crockett is my best friend. <laughs> all right, I have one last compliance question for Julie, but and you kind of touched on it. Does compliance have to be the buzzkill? You know, is is there room for compliance in a, in a company's branding, particularly what we're seeing right now with these vaporizer cartridges, or or is compliance just you know the the buzzkill in the room that no one wants to talk about? You mean vapocalypse, as I call it. Vapocalypse. <laughs> I mean, I think, because I'm super weird and geeky, that, um, I mean, I call compliance like high-stakes ninja Tetris, which is where 
you know, it's seeing the grid. It's like the matrix. You like see all the forms and what's possible, and then you determine how to navigate those forms. And, and the important thing too, I, I mean, we, we often joke that sometimes I think the worst idea the cannabis industry ever had was we just want to be treated like other businesses. It's like, no, you don't. No, you don't. It's terrible out there. Um, but because you know, the cannabis industry, once it became the commercial cannabis industry, became not only liable for all of the cannabis regulations, but for every regulation, for building and safety and public resources and advertising and marketing and the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act and consumer lawsuits. And there are attorneys holding CLE classes right now on how to sue the cannabis industry. And there's all these aspects, like dram shop laws haven't been introduced. So yes, you can sue the bud tender that served you if you take too much and go get in an accident. You know, there's all these protections that don't exist yet. But that also requires, you know, not only being a visionary in the area of the cannabis space, but being able to navigate and, and kind of future see all of these different regulations and how these things are going to come into play. You know, right now we're in a state-based economy, being able to predict what is interstate commerce going to look like, what is federal regulation going to look like, what is international import-export going to look like. You know, those are, those are business aspects that have to be navigated. But one of the things that's amazing, I mean, this is where education becomes so critical, because while everyone's like, oh my God, vapes will kill you, evidently, you know, <laughs> one of the things that's interesting when you look at the situation is that so far, help us all, not a single case of any of these vape-related illnesses or deaths can be tied to, an, to a licensed regulated product. This is tobacco e-cig juice that isn't really regulated at all. This is illicit market that is not really regulated at all. So because the cannabis industry in California, for example, undergoes such rigorous testing that the cleanest thing in California is the cannabis that you're smoking, okay. is, you know, this, this has... As much as it was so irritating that we were, you know, so overregulated and the testing requirements are so awful in some ways, um, this is something we've managed to skirt for the licensed industry. How that plays out on the public stage, you know, where you know, the federal government is now talking about banning vapes because, uh, because there's a problem, um, Th that's yet to be seen, but it really is important to get into that, the, the discernment in the educational part of that to understand, you know, what is really happening there and what is really the issue. And, and I will say, again, just last thing with compliance and regulation is that one of the things we're suffering from so greatly as an industry and a people is the, the, one of the worst things about prohibition, other than, you know, how many people went to jail and lives were destroyed, is how much research was not able to happen. So we really are like super excited in this green rush and ah, oh, there's so much money to be made and let's do it. But with no science and no research. So it may have seemed like a great idea that vitamin E is helpful, let's put it in a vape. Terrible idea. Terrible idea, you know, but, but these are things that we're going to discover as a fledgling industry that, that we need the science, we need the research, we need those things. Um, and that's kind of where the FDA, as frustrated as people are looking at the FDA, not legalizing CBD to be put in everything, you know, they're like, well, we'd like to have some science, you know, to make sure it's okay before we do that, uh, which doesn't seem crazy. Thank you, Julie. Yes. <laughs> That's what I have to so say. So compliance is sexy, see? It's, <laughs> compliance is our cannabis industry right so now. So we're seeing in more and more of these cities, more and more of these states, social equity is playing a big part in determining who gets licensed, who's awarded licenses. What, what role, this is for everybody, like how are you seeing brands incorporate social responsibility and social equity into their, their brand values and, and how they implement it and are they doing enough? 
I think it's a cornerstone piece of the majority of the businesses that I've had the pleasure of working with. And even the big folks like Canopy, uh, they're spending $20 million or something in the United States right now uh, helping social causes. Uh, I think it's important for all business to be socially conscious. I think in an industry where we're healing uh, 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 the, the scars of war, uh, because it has been a war on drugs for you know too long, uh, that, that we all have that responsibility. So when I look across, the majority of people are doing the most incredible, incredible things. I think the nature of cannabis is social healing. And, you know, all, all the fun that we, you know, have in bringing this, this medicine to the world it's also about healing all the fears. And so it, it's, you have to, you have to move step by step. And Etheridge Farms actually has, uh, our, our, our branch will be um, the Etheridge Foundation, which uh, my best friend here, Julie Crockett, is uh, you know, very instrumental in, in putting together just exactly what that can look like can actually help other brands, other uh, uh, companies fulfill their need for the social equity and exactly what that looks like. And so Etheridge Foundation is totally going deep into that to find a way and to you know, make, make the best uh, pathway to uh, bringing in, to training uh, people coming out of, the, out of the prisons, to training the homeless and, and you know, bringing that, that social aspect in. And we're really, really excited about that. Julie, have you seen any, any particular businesses or brands incorporate social equity in, in, in a really meaningful way that impressed you? I mean, it's interesting when I think about it. I, I mean, the first thing that always pops in mind for me is Bloom Farms, which is a, a, a brand out of San Francisco that from the gate, I mean, from way, way back, they've always done a one to one for every product that they sell. They provide a meal so that it was kind of a very early uh, example of, of leading with that as as part of your your mission. and. I mean, I've, I've seen more people kind of struggling with the concept of how to truly incorporate it in a meaningful way, um, especially in, for example, in the Los Angeles equity program, a lot of the focus has been on ownership and, and making sure to have equity owned businesses. And it, uh, what we're kind of looking at now is it's kind. It's kind of leave it to leave it to mankind that um, every beautiful idea will just be mangled unrecognizably in some way. Uh, so, so you you kind of see a lot of these um, faux partnerships or strangely structured agreements where where people in effect are taking advantage of somebody's status as an equity applicant to be able to attach it to their business. And this may benefit some people, um, uh, individuals, but, but in terms of the spirit of Prop 64 and the social justice platform with which it was voted on, that, that so many people I believe that voted for Prop 64 was they wanted an end to the, they wanted it decriminalized and they wanted an end to the criminalization and they wanted that reinvestment in communities. So what I love about this moment is that pretty much you don't get to go to a cannabis event or have a cannabis conversation without talking about social justice, social equity, community reinvestment, and, and how to make that happen in a meaningful way. Uh, and, and for that, I'm super grateful that this, these are interesting times where we get to have these uncomfortable conversations quite often on how to make this um, not just uh, you know, not just a little tip of the hat to like, and we're diverse, you know, where it, it, it's, it's like, how are we really gonna look at the carnage, you know, and, and begin to address that? One in six people uh, behind bars are there for nonviolent drug offenses. Yeah. We created a third class. There are more people with a criminal record than there are people with college degrees. So 
I think it's great too that social equity is relevant and that it becomes a part how we look at what social equity actually is and at what point does social equity become currency uh, is something that we probably collectively need to take a stronger look at. We need to get people's uh, records expunged and there are people that are working toward that diligently. Um, but man, we got a lot of work to do. Yeah, I mean, I would just say too, one of it's interesting the lens that it puts on certain issues in the industry because you hear, I've had this conversation with a lot of like senators and Congress people and all these things where we talk about the need for banking in the cannabis industry. And there's a perception that the need for banking and some of the narrative transmitted is, oh, because we all have all this money and it's so dangerous because I'm sitting on this pile of money and I need to be able to take it to the bank. And it's like, that's not the issue. The issue with no banking is that it's harder for women and people of color and small businesses to get loans to start businesses if there's no banking. Um, and <laughs> with the social equity, you know, there's a couple people like uh, um, uh, Steve D'Angelo is doing the Last Prisoner Project, and we support that, and we're all about that. And I think that the LA social equity program was one of the best, honestly, because it does require the partner own 51%. It can't be sold. And much like you said, I've seen these contracts where they've manipulated that. But like you said, I think in four years, these will be taken apart and that the, you know, the compliance will follow. Where with, you know, what Tyson Ranch did is uh, we funded these operations with no hope of owning any of them, honestly. It was just a grant and a loan to, uh, you know, Mike's passion about that growing up, where he grew up in the streets and affected by the war on drugs the way that he was. But the last prisoner project, everybody should get involved with that. What that is is Steve D'Angelo's project to get everybody who's in jail for cannabis out and not leave anybody behind. I think I think also it's important as consumers, like to the kind of having discussions about social equity kind of seems like an insular conversation sometimes of the industry people who are in it and into licensing, but for average consumer on the street, they may not be like, what's a social equity program? So, I mean, I've been just discussing this. I'm also in a board member in CCIA, which is the California Cannabis Industry Association. And one of the things in their um, diversity, inclusion, and social equity committee is, you know, what I would love to see from a branding perspective is for social equity to be become something like free trade, where there's people who they don't know what free trade means, but they look at their coffee and they go, that's got to be good, and then they get it. So having that be a concept that goes throughout the supply chain, because I've been contacted and I deal with manufacturers, for example, in Oakland, who got the license. They did it. They made a product. They're a social equity business, and now they can't get distribution, and they can't get shelf space, and nobody's carrying their product. So it really has to be a commitment, not just to let's help you get this license, it's how do we help you be successful all along the supply chain, and so much of that on the consumer level comes down to education, and, and the mandate upon the agencies themselves, the businesses, and the cities to educate consumers about what does this even mean. Right? Yep. Yeah, that's right. Amen. <laughs> Julie, you, you always, you nailed it. Always. <laughs> yep. Jason, I, I'm going to ask you a question to you, and, and then anyone else can jump in on it, but authenticity is a, a big buzzword with cannabis brands. What, what does it mean for a cannabis brand to be authentic? Authenticity, uh, you know, again, when you think about Mr. Plumbing or dancing to, to your, your, your own tune, uh, comes through in so very many ways. We live in a segmented society where a psychographic becomes more and more relevant. For those of you that don't know what psychographic is, demographic is age, sex, et cetera. Psychographic is what you're doing, the way you move around, the choices that you make, et cetera. Authenticity from a brand, especially an adaptive one, this is a commoditized product. Really, brands being able to help people hold margins come back to and tie back to specific ideologies. And the person or the brand, that I, whilst I might be looking at Heavy Grass, for instance, as a heavy metal brand, and that's interesting to me, um, you know, I might have a contemporary uh, looking at Etheridge uh, Farms and tying back to those ideologies. Holding margin, creating a brand promise, all tie back uh, uh, to an authentic approach. And, and I think that that's more powerful often than even sort of celebrity uh, is ideology. 
And so what does authenticity mean in this space where brands are young? You know, it takes hundreds of years in certain instances, Coke, Pepsi, uh, and so many more. If you look at the legacies of Condoleezza or Unilever or any of these organizations, these are brands that built equity, built the promise over time. Uh, and therein lies the authenticity. So I'll tell you, the most authentic brand will be on the shelf 20 years from now uh, with a message of quality and standards uh, that people can relate to. Where I look to authenticity today uh, is, is in the communities built around the brand and their ability to execute on things like social equity and more. Uh, because in, in the absence or the vacuum of that establishment, uh, we have to look to our internal company ideologies uh, to create that authenticity. Anybody want to add anything? <laughs> no, it's all good, okay. <laughs> I think we got a lot of folks in the audience who, who are starting their companies, they're starting their brands. Um, do, you, do you guys have any insights to offer them, lessons learned that you've learned over the last five, ten, however many years in the cannabis industry that you wish you had learned, that you wish you had known when you started that could help these folks in the audience today? Uh, it's more than you ever dreamed <laughs> on all levels. It's harder than you thought it would be. It's more rewarding than you thought it would be. It's world changing. Uh, your own money goes a long way. <laughs> you know, the things that, um, and it's always changing. So the best thing, the best thing for you to do is to know that shortcuts are shortcuts for a reason. And if you really, if you really, if, if your heart and your spirit and your soul is into this cannabis, whatever you've got, brand or, or whatever, that your, your belief in it will be what manifests, that, 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 that's what we're looking for. That, that's why branding cannabis is so different than anything else. It's going to be the quality of the product. It's going to be that uh, authentic, this is what we're talking about. Because we're, con we're talking about consciousness. We're talking about how consciousness affects health. We're talking about raising consciousness. And it's a conversation that we've barely just begun. I would say a couple, there's so many things that we could talk on it for an extended period of time. I think that a lot of people come in and, and to feed off what Melissa said, they come in with gut, they come in with feeling, emotion, and a tie back to the plant and the space. I would say that you need to take that a step further. Today, we're starting to get the kind of data um, that traditional CPG companies have. Um, and we can all relate um, you know, to a brand in some way or another, but understanding your audience, the quantitative and qualitative data that feeds some of the choices that we make, we couldn't do two years ago. We certainly couldn't do five years ago. There are data companies and ultimately things we can do ourselves to, to, to not have to be a gut reactive organization. And identifying the type of, of consumer that falls in line with your ideologies and being able to, to connect with them means understanding their behaviors um, and understanding what moves them. Uh, and I think that uh, in the last panel, there was a gentleman that, or, or somebody spoke about a number being put on a box for collectors uh, and how that changed the perception uh, of the product. Uh, and again, it was like a, a figurine or something of that nature. The idea being that connecting to your audience comes through understanding who they are. And that doesn't, that's not always driven by gut. So use data. Uh, there are shortcuts. Please use them. The other part of that is business fundamentals. I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but I've had so many conversations with folks that haven't even approached the concept of their own unit economics uh, moving into all of these broad sort of business ideologies. And so if you can take a minute to make sure you've planned, that you've dotted your I's, that you've crossed your T's, that you've looked at regulation, that you understand your building circumstances and all of the... I mean, talk about a regulatory nightmare. <laughs> so, so, so those are the things. Again, just, just use data, please. Use data. Um, if I had to give advice, it would be 
you know, very much what you said uh, back to, you, you're going to need to be authentic. If you got into this for the money, you're too late for that. <laughs> you know, cannabis is entering the fabric of the economy. Um, so all the get rich is over. You know, when people quit going to jail, now it's just another product. You're entering the fabric of the economy. It's going to be, you know, Wall Street and big brands taking all the money, and it'll be shitty jobs for everybody else, honestly. And as we move, <laughs> if, well, I mean, <laughs> as we move into the fabric of the economy, and you're entering this space, you need to be genuine, honestly. You need to, if you don't love cannabis, this probably isn't the space for you. And if you're looking around your board of directors and less of them get high than do, then this is a consumable. This is like cheeseburgers. Your body craves a cheeseburger because it's good. And if it isn't good, you're going to drive by that logo every time. You, this is a consumable. If you're not, you don't love this and you don't know a lot about it, it's like diamonds. You, you could sell me a bad diamond, I wouldn't know, because I don't know about diamonds. But you have to be genuine in the cannabis space to be long-term successful in the cannabis space. And this will be a great career and a great path for many companies, but it won't be for the ones that are here to get rich. That will fade out as it enters the fabric of the economy, and only the genuine brands will, will survive. Because the consumer, they're not stupid. These are cheeseburgers. They know what they like. You know what I mean? And if they don't like it, they are not going to crave it. And I would just say, um, I would encourage people to pioneer. You know? I mean, that was the thing. When I met Melissa, the thing I was, of the many things I was impressed with, <laughs> one of the things that struck me was this combination of incredible patience and incredible drive and faith. And when, you know, I look back at your career, it's not that you didn't, you didn't do something that was there for you to do. <laughs> it's like you <laughs> kicked, you know, to, and plowed the field and, and went, you know, created the, the, the path. And that's the thing that I find so exciting about interacting with the people who I get to meet in cannabis in all the aspects. Because if you think about, it's not even just the, the plant itself, even just the ancillary things. Like Aaron was a pioneer of Los Angeles, you know, cannabis attorney when nobody would touch it and nobody was doing it. So we're in this incredibly exciting time of Getting, I mean, that's my background. I don't have a background in business. I come from theater. Um, uh, no. Hey, Linda. Yes. Uh, so, um, but that was the thing is I got recruited into the cannabis industry and I met with the state the first time and I met with the government and then I realized, oh, everybody's making this up? Yes. That's what I do. Like, I make stuff up all day. Um, so, so that you get to like, we get to invent a new industry so like yeah. we get to so this this incredible drive that people have to make cannabis like every other industry that exists already or let's get super corporate and do it the way that amazon does why why <laughs> we could do something new we could do something new and the good news is if we don't and we mess up and we fumble the ball and we just do something old and boring again Cannabis has been around for thousands of years. It will be around for thousands of years. She will wait. Yay. She will wait for the pioneers to come and change the world. Yes, amen. <laughs> Where's our guitar? Well said, Julie, as usual. I, I think we're coming close to time. This is probably like the question portion with the audience of folks have questions for our wonderful panel. Anybody, anybody, anyone? Can you tell us a little bit about how your product line specifically is geared toward moms? That's for me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Etheridge Farms is dedicated to be the brand that when you finally get brave enough to walk into a dispensary, 
that you're gonna, it's gonna be on the wall, it's gonna, hopefully it'll be a guitar case, <laughs> <laughs> on the wall, and you will be able to go to it just like a middle-aged woman goes to find her information. It's gonna be clear the way we talk, it's gonna be headache here, are you sleep? Are we talking sleep? It's the issues that, and I, I just say women because women are 80 to 90 percent of the, you know, the price point. They're the ones who buy everything for the families, and so you, you, put the information, and that's what that's what it's all about right now is information. I can't tell you how many women I meet that are like, well, I do it, but I don't know. What's this about CBD? What's this about what? What are all these, you know, consonants and you know, what what is this? And so to to research and to one have the product that absolutely comes through. Have you know our our medicine uh, scientists and stuff that, that that I have are the best and the best. They are, they are, have been dedicated their lives to making medicine, to making holistic medicine. So all of this goes into when you look at that product and I'm putting my name on it, I'm saying Etheridge Farms, Etheridge says that this is in the range. Again, the medicine is not one size fits all, but it, it, it at least guides you to, hey, this is what you can try for these issues. One, one thing I hardly ever hear talking about is menopause. Cannabis is great for menopause, you know, and, but that's not sexy. Nobody's going to, you know, Snoop's not, probably not going to talk about that. But, you know, this, these are the things that, that we are just going to, that we are focusing on. Hi, Melissa, big fan. I Thank hope you. this doesn't make you feel old, but I used to listen to all your songs on the way to preschool. Right on. <laughs> all my, I have a lot of songs. <laughs> um, I'm an attorney, and one of the biggest things I see when celebrities come into the fold is finding a trustworthy team, finding a trustworthy partner. Do you have a partner, and how did you surround yourself with a good team? I have, yes, I do, and I'm going to introduce them I'm going to say, I, I, I went on a journey 15 years ago to understand cannabis, and um, I found myself uh, in Northern California, of course, where for decades they've been growing and, of course, making the medicine, you know, illegally for a long, long time, and they are the ones who really have, from, from the Steve D'Angelo's to the, you know, the Valerie, um, at, at, thank you, yeah, to these, these women who, and, and men who have fought the good fight, spent the time in jail, you know, did, did this, brought it to us. I found myself in Northern California, and uh, the business side of it absolutely narrowed it down, <laughs> and I found um, a couple, and they're, and they're right here, uh, Josie and Cricket Roberto, they're right over there uh, from Santa Cruz, and, and they had, they had a, uh, a brand, it was called Naturally Mystic, when the medicinal licenses were put out, and then when uh, California went um, recreational, everyone had to start over again, and they were willing to rebrand their products as Etheridge Farms. The Naturally Mystic products absolutely met the criteria of organic, vegan, uh, you know, gluten-free, all, 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 the, all the things that um, I, as, as a consumer myself, you know, would require, but all the things that we're going to present that are very, very important. Not only have they made the medicine, do they know the cultivators and the growers, um, they've also worked with the local government, with the city, with the county. It's one of the reasons that we are the first, again, the first manufacturing license in Santa Cruz County, which you would think there would be tons because it's Santa Cruz. But, um, you know, of course, we've all found out the, the political um, and the legal side of this is, is very slow moving. So yes, and my wife is also here, who's my partner in it too, hello Linda. So yes, that, that's who we partnered with, that's what we have a, uh, uh, a manufacturing plant up there and we're, we're headed out this year, we're doing it. Uh, Julie, this is to you, this is Bob Lewis here. You talked about pioneers and I've just made a decision because of your calling, because I have a calling and I want my last career chapter to be meaningful. And I see and have heard, and I mentioned earlier in a session today, that the industry is missing 
really what I would say is a public facing messaging campaign, a communication strategy. And I've been working with KCSA and others uh, on the ambition, but I think I just wanna sort of invite your support, Aaron and Julie and Melissa and others to sort of help me develop a nonprofit called Can Strong Partners that basically will be issuing free content to any cannabis company, any state association, federal association that can be distributed on a monthly basis. So we have PSA campaigns across the country that are normalizing the conversation and bringing responsible messaging to the industry. And I just like your support uh, because I'm gonna be that pioneer. And I appreciate you using that term because that's who I am and that's what I need to do and my heart's in the right place. So I thank you for that calling. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It is, I mean, it's something that we've discussed is it's a very difficult, uh, you know, position that the industry is in because of regulations in some ways is that lack of ability to educate. Because even when Melissa was talking about how clear she wants her products to be and say headache and sleep, my little compliance heart goes like, you can't say headache and sleep. I know. You can't say that. You can't. You tell them what it does. <laughs> we'll it, just call it nighty night. Nighty night night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so it's difficult because there is the need for those third-party, non-biased, educational, you know, arms and it's and it's a little disappointing you know the bcc did a huge multi-million dollar contract for education and we're all like oh yay there's finally going to be education and most of the education they came out was you had your chance now get a license and in a state where only a third of municipalities are issuing licenses that's kind of insulting you know that no people did not have their chance and no you can't just go get a license the, 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 these are the challenges of the industry. So uh, across the board, same thing. The consumer, for a consumer to even understand what a licensed and unlicensed dispensary means. You know, I got recruited to launch a cannabis vaporizer company in early 2015, and I didn't discover until two weeks in when I had my first meeting with Aaron, who was our attorney, that I had just been put in charge of an entirely illegal company. <laughs> That's why I'm so into compliance. <laughs> It's, it's tough. That's why when I came to you and said, should I join this company? You said, no. And no. you worked for them. <laughs> no. Hell no. That's when I passed the authenticity yes, test. Yes, you did. Thank you. My question follows up on that. In the circles that you are all traveling in, is the idea of educating consumers about buying legal from legal dispensaries coming up? And what are you all doing to be proactive about it within your company. Thank you. Josh, Shelley, and I are building uh, content on a regular basis. It's on the education side. Um, so from uh, Canada and in the United States, being able to uh, share information is critical. I think when you first walked into Starbucks, you didn't know what the hell a mente latte was. Uh, and now we're trying to figure out weeds. So um, internally, uh, from a compliance perspective, we rely heavily on Julie and then try to stitch in uh, as much of, of that guidance into the content that we produce and provide. Content uh, from every company, uh, as far as being able to discuss ideologies, uh, to go back to that authentic brand story uh, and to continue to convey trust. Uh, I think that every company has a responsibility to educate not only its consumers, but continue to layer that education and I think that content and, and distribution of that content is the biggest gift uh, that there is from that education perspective. All right, I think we're gonna um, cut it there unless anybody had anything to add to that. No, okay. Thank you so much to our panelists for taking their time. Thank you panel, this was we're great. We're gonna get ready for the next panel.